thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, and uh, my name is Bob Newton, and I am the director of SEEDS here at Smith College. And it is our pleasure to sort of host this, this uh, lecture. Uh, and to, we're always happy to work with the Kestrel Trust. Um, we do work with the Kestrel Trust at SEEDS. And also at Smith College, there are many uh, students who work with Kestrel Trust. It's a really outstanding organization, does a lot of really good work. So it's really nice to be here for this uh, talk tonight and have uh, Bill Umau give a, a, a lecture. And so to start, um, uh, Jonas is going to give the introduction, and we'll get started. Hi, everyone. It's so wonderful to see so many of us here. Uh, my name is Robert Jonas, and all my friends call me Jonas. You probably know that. Um, it's really good for the soul and the spirit to see so many of us here who care for our natural resources that we have inherited in the Pioneer Valley. And we have inherited these things. And so we need to pass them on in a responsible way to our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. It's also true that we live in a dark, perilous, fragile time, uh, uncertain time, when our natural world is under siege, a time when our current government considers our natural resources as mere objects for human consumption and development. We see it happening all around us. No ocean, river, mountain, national park, or forest is considered sacred to those who have the power to destroy or protect. So this is a good time to get together like this, to support one another, to fight for the life of our forests, and really our civilization, when you look at the big picture, and our planet. So on behalf of Kestrel and Smith College Center for Environment, uh, Ecological Design and Sustainability, and our, our whole community of nature lovers, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Bill Mumau, Professor Emeritus of International Environmental Policy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at, at Tufts University. I just want to add one more thought. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Mumau's career, I was, I've been reading some of his online uh, papers, as a scientist and an earth and forest protector has blossomed in several organizations, academic classes, policy papers, and dialogues with politicians, faith leaders, and NGOs around the world. It's really quite a phenomenal career. In this context, I, I also want to give a shout out to Kestrel Land Trust, who've been doing this work of conserving land and forests and air quality, water quality in the valley for just about 50 years now, am I right? Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a great partnership to be at the center here and also to be learning from Dr. Mumau and um, maybe add our, our voice to the work that he's doing. We really need each other now to do what's the work that's ahead. So thanks so much, Dr. Mumau. Thank you very much, Jonas, and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I've already blown my credibility with a typo on the first slide. I got the date wrong. <laughs> Spell check doesn't catch those kind of things. It, it's really, um, I remember when, when word processors first came out, I was very disappointed because they didn't process anything. They made all the mistakes that I made, just made them bigger. <laughs> so um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully do better in the rest of this, uh, this presentation. Um, uh, I want to thank the organizers uh, uh, who, who put this all together, from the Kestrel Trust and Smith College. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, wonderful to see this kind of a turnout for, uh, for this topic. Uh, what I want to do is I want to, I'll, I'll start with just very briefly introducing you to the two ends of this title. First of all, it's a pretty presumptuous title, Forests Will Determine the future of our climate. And it's deliberately so because forests and indeed all of natural ecosystems are considered marginal when we talk about addressing climate change. And what I hope to leave you with this evening is <clears throat> the understanding that they are central and uh, what we can do to make sure that they're able to do their job. So. Um, New England forest, right? Everybody recognizes a New England forest. Something about it. Um, 
This is a Bob Leverett picture. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we'll have more Bob Leverett pictures later in the program. Um, you know, the, the rocks, the trees, the, the ground cover, the ferns, it's a, it's, it's a very uh, biodiverse um, uh, forest. And, you know, there he is, just, just, just staring me down, right? <laughs> Not the least bit intimidated by my presence. So I'm the intruder, it's his or her territory. But I also want to talk then about, uh, talk, uh, move to talking about the climate system. And I promise you, this is the only PowerPoint slide we're going to PowerPoint you. <laughs> and it's just up here for informational purposes. The climate system, it's pretty simple. The energy comes from the sun, light. It's absorbed by the surface of the earth. It's absorbed by the leaves of plants. It, is, um, uh, it heats up the land, it heats up the ocean. Some of it gets reflected back into space before it ever gets to the surface of the earth or to the ocean by clouds or by ice and by snow, by glaciers, by the Arctic sea ice, back in the days when we had Arctic sea ice. And what's happened is because that Arctic sea ice has melted so rapidly and we've lost so much of it, the Arctic is warming at over twice the rate of the rest of the planet. And that is not only changing the Arctic, it's changing weather patterns all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. The jet stream is not your grandfather's jet stream anymore. It has been changed by the fact that the difference in temperature between our latitude and the North Pole is now less than it has been nobody knows in how long. That means that as the warm air rises from our latitude and goes north and the cold, dense air comes south and creates the, the jet stream, because the Earth then turns under it, and it looks like the wind is blowing, but actually the current, the current of air, but actually it's the Earth is turning under a north to south flow of cold, dense air. It doesn't flow the way it used to. And that's why we have 60 degrees today we're going to have a nor'easter in two days. We had temperatures in the single digits just a few weeks ago. And we get these very strange weather patterns, including one where the North Pole is warmer than we are in Massachusetts in, 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 in January or February. Unprecedented, above freezing. The sun has not shown on the North Pole since last September. And yet it was 45 degrees there one day. Stunning. So things are changing uh, because we have changed this system. And as the Earth radiates heat back to space, there are gases in the atmosphere that trap that heat. And they re-radiate it. They radiate half of it up and half of it back down. One of the little known facts is we get twice as much in energy terms, twice as much energy from the warm atmosphere that's trapped this heat coming down to Earth than we get directly from the sun on any given day. So we are really storing a lot of heat up there and radiating it back down. So um, carbon dioxide is responsible for about two-thirds of this heat trapping. And then there are other greenhouse gases that come from, from um, heat trapping gases that come from uh, burning, uh, that comes from burning oil, coal, gas, and wood and other plant material. <coughs> And uh, the additional greenhouse gases are things like methane that come from fertilizer, or uh, methane comes from, from, um, from cattle and, and uh, other, other uh, ruminants, and uh, nitrous oxide from fertilizer, and then all these commercial gases and things that we release. And the Earth's temperature is regulated by these heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere. And this little cartoon of the way, way it works, there's the sunlight coming in, some of it's being reflected by clouds. Some of it's being reflected from the ocean, from the ice. And some of it's being absorbed. We know exactly. It's 343 watts per square meter. Right? Three and a half of those old-fashioned 100 watt tungsten light bulbs. Nobody, you know, younger people don't even know what those are anymore. But for those, there's, there are people in the audience, I think, who remember them. I'm looking out there. I think you do. Um, and only about half of that, it gets actually absorbed. And 
the Earth, as it warms up, is radiating heat back into space. That's what those sort of orangey lines are. And it's, it's, uh, it's infrared radiation, radiant heat. And those gases absorb it, and they re-emit some of it out and some of it back down. So that's basically how it works. It's a pretty, pretty basic system. And a lot of people don't fully understand it. But I'll show you why it's important and how it works in just a moment. So carbon dioxide being so important, let's just follow the, follow the path here. Um, there's something around 860, 70 you know, gigatons means billions of tons. It's, sorry, that's just what the, you know, it's a slide from a research paper and they had gigatons, so I have to use gigatons, but it's billion tons of carbon. And there's about 600 billion tons in growing plants trees, forests, so forth. Um, there's about 2,200 billion tons in soils there on the far left-hand side. And you can see from industry, fossil fuels, burning industry, we put about 9 billion tons. From land use change, converting land into uh, cutting down forests and turning into agriculture, is about another one. So we have about 10 billion tons going up. And yet, every year, we only see 4.4 appear. Where did the other part go? Well, about three of those tons went into the growing more trees and converted into uh, humus and soils. The ocean absorbs another about two, a little over two and a half, 2.6. Three and 2.6 is 5.6, minus 10 is 4.4. That's how it works. We'll see why that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about how we're going to address climate change. Just a, just a little explanation about the way this atmosphere thing works. If you look at a pane of glass, visible light comes in, the yellow. There's, you have the cold outdoors and the warm indoors. But as the radiant heat tries to go out the window, most of it gets reflected back in, right? That's why it's called the greenhouse effect. Because when the French physicist who figured out something was going on in the world, he was thinking of a greenhouse where you grow plants, a glass house. And uh, so the f term greenhouse was, uh, was, um, was coined. Oops. Wait. Uh, and, there's, and so the glass is like the carbon dioxide. Well, if this had been discovered 100 years later in 1927 instead of 1827, it would be called the hot car effect. And that's something we've all experienced. Many of us have not been in a greenhouse, but all of us have been in a hot car. And hot oven or hot car, it's the same thing. Don't leave your dog in the, or your child in the car. And over here just shows how rapidly, if you leave, it's 75 degrees outside, it takes only 10 minutes for it to be 100 degrees inside on a sunny day. It takes 30 minutes and you're at 120 degrees. If it's 85 outside, you are at 140 degrees in just 15, if it's 100 degrees outside, 15 minutes is 140 degrees. That's lethal. That's lethal. So. Um, the hot car effect is not something we want to do um, on Earth. But this is what we're seeing. Hot, extreme heat danger. This was taken in Death Valley with all those heat waves you can see. And what it does is to illustrate just exactly, um, I mean, this is the manifestation of what I just described. This is why the Earth is heating up. We're putting more and more of these heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere so it's like we're making, uh, we're putting triple pane windows on instead of double pane windows, and it's reflecting more infrared radiation back inside. That's good in your house. It's not good here. Um, and so this is what's happened with carbon dioxide. Um, if we go all the way back to pre-industrial times, the number on the left is 280, and that's um, well, 300 would be 0.03 percent of the atmosphere. This is in 300 out of 340 there in 1980 is 340 carbon dioxide molecules out of every million air molecules. That's all that it means. 
And it oscillates up and down with the seasons because these data were taken uh, because, well, because there's more, there are more plants and things that are dependent on temperature. Everyone, please turn off your cell phone. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's two strikes. I get one more, don't I? <laughs> um, and and there, there, there's, a, there, there's much more land in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. And, and, uh, and, and so we get this cyclical oscillation for the whole, the average for the whole Earth uh, because of that. Because in the wintertime, uh, uh, there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In the spring and summer, the plants suck it in and, and it goes down. And then every, next year, it goes up and down and up and down like that. Yes? Well, 350, all right, 350 is an arbitrary number. Uh, Bill McKibben is a great marketer, and he figured out, uh, and he did it at the time we were just about passing 350. So he was saying, let's not go beyond this. But 280 is where, where we're meant to be in terms of the planet we had before. So 350 is just, a, um, it, it's just an arbitrary number, but it's, it's useful to have something that everybody agrees would be bad to go beyond. And um, so now we're up here over four. We're at 406 or seven or something like that right now. So that's a huge increase. Um, and has it had an effect on temperature? It's had an effect on temperature. This is, the, this is, the th this is the basically the thermometer record uh, of measurements with a little bit of adjustments where, when you don't have thermometers everywhere, but um, there are about uh, 7,000 stations around the world. Bradley Field is one of them. Uh, Logan Airport in Boston is one of them. Um, and um, now with the internet, it's easy. They just send in the high temperature and the low temperature for the day, and that's, it's not really the average, it's the median, if you're going to be technical about it. But, but it doesn't matter as long as you don't change the rules and do it the same way all the time. And then those are all gathered together, and each one is weighted by um, a jigsaw puzzle that's been created of the area around it. So for example, if there's only one station on um, Easter Island, there's a big ocean around there. That gets weighted a lot because it's representing a big area. Here in the Northeast, I mean, these areas are pretty small because we've got so many stations around. Um, and then the black dot is the average for that year. And it goes up and it goes down. The green bars are the 95% confidence level, meaning statistically, 95% uh, is 95% likely that the number is between those, the ends of those, that, that, those green bars. And you see the bars get smaller as we go closer to the present. We have better data. We have more stations. There were fewer stations back here. So you look at this and you watch how it goes, and it goes up and it goes down. It kind of levels out between 1940 and 1980, and then it just takes off, just takes off. And look here, that's, that's, uh, that's 2016 at the top, right? 2015 before, 2014 before that. Now what's troubling is, if you look at worldwide emissions of carbon dioxide, they were constant in those three years. They did not go up at all. The emissions stayed the same, and yet it got warmer. Why? Why? When we understand that, we then see what we might do uh, to address the problem. So um, there's the United Nations Treaty, 1992. The ultimate objective of this convention is stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. In other words, we don't want to change the, 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 the um, heat trapping blanket in a way that's going to be dangerous to all of us. Right? And such a level should be achieved in a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt, to allow us to be able to ensure food production, and that we don't threaten economic development. Why would we want to threaten economic development, right? I mean, we're destroying economic development by having global warming. But nevertheless, that's, all, that's, that's what was in there. But at least there's a time, 
a time concern. It's not just when just getting to that level or, or, or keeping that level the concentration low, but we should do it in a timely fashion because if we don't, we have bigger problems. Well, how in Paris, as you know, we got an agreement, and every country in the world agreed, although one of them is trying to disagree right now. And it uh, make, makes you proud to be in America, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's really pretty awful. So as the, um, when you looked in December uh, uh, 2015, the goal was uh, of the treaty of the Paris Agreement was to stay within two degrees, no, not to rise more than two degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, and to make every effort to stay at one and a half degrees Celsius. Now that's 3.6 Fahrenheit and 6.3 Fahrenheit. I, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, 3.6 and uh, and uh, and uh, um, is two degrees, and uh, 2.7 is one and a half degrees. If you look at everything that everybody proposed, it's going to be three and a half degrees or 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit. If we did nothing, it would be four and a half degrees or 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, we've saved one degree, one degree C. We've, we, we've, we've gone from eight to six, if, the, if that's all we do. But the treaty says we'll keep trying to do more. And next year, all the countries are getting together and they're gonna say, here's what I'm gonna do more. And that's why it's unfair to Americans to have to be part of it, I guess. I don't know why. That's what our president told us. The treaty is unfair to Americans. We get to decide what we're gonna do. We can say we're not gonna do anything. Okay, fine, others will do more. It's really a very strange situation we're in right now. Very troubling. Okay, so um, if we wanna think about solutions, we have to think about how this really works. So you think about that diagram where we have uh, carbon dioxide coming out of stacks and from clearing fields and increasingly from burning bioenergy, burning trees to make electricity in Europe and in parts of the United States, burning plant material and calling it green because it comes from green plants, I guess, and, 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 uh, and we make it into ethanol in our cars and in Europe, big demand for biodiesel and so you'll see that that doesn't work very well either. But to understand how it works, how, the, how that works and what we can do about it, think of carbon dioxide as, as if it were water in a bathtub. Think of the atmosphere as a bathtub and we have it, water in it at a certain level. That's the carbon dioxide. There's more coming in from the faucet and there's some being drained out the other end. And you saw before that there were, there were, there were 10 units per year coming in and five and a half going out. And so what's gonna to happen to the level in the bathtub? It's gonna go up. And if it keeps going up, it's gonna overflow. That's a metaphor for a bad outcome <laughs> if it's carbon dioxide. All right, so we have these two things going and the reason that car carbon dioxide kept increasing even though we leveled off our emissions is because emissions still exceeded removals, right? We didn't bring it down. It's still going in the same way it was uh, the first year we hit that level. Now, it's good to, to have leveled it out, but actually we ticked up last year, 2017. But nevertheless, we're, 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 we're doing something, but we're not doing nearly enough. This is a simulation that was put together by John Sturman at MIT and his students. Um, and basically what it shows, the, the, um, the blue line is <clears throat> the trajectory we've been on since, uh, since 2000. He did this work around 2010. Um, and, and so the blue line is, is, is the straight line extrapolation of what we were doing. And by the way, we're, we've been still pretty much on that trajectory. And the blue line on this side is what it's done to the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you can see that it goes up and we were in 2000, we were at about 300 and I don't know, say 80 or 90 parts per million. And by 2100, we'll be at 750, right? Now, if we had just stopped adding it, 
in 2010 and just level, kept it constant just as we did for those three years, it would rise like the red line on the right. So better, but still it's rising, right? It's, it's still growing. And the reason is, of course, because um, we're still exceeding the rate at which it can be removed by natural systems. By the way, one of the, th one of the provisions of the Paris Treaty is by 2050, we will all agree we're not going to add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than natural systems can remove. Promise? Well, we'll see. Okay. So what will we do to deal with this? Well, they did a scenario where they said, okay, suppose starting around 2020, just about now actually, 2018, we began dropping following that curve that went down on the left-hand side. What would that do to concentrations? And it's quite amazing. Brings it in right on target, 450 parts per million. We won't exceed 450 parts per million. 450 parts per million will probably exceed two degrees, but you know, it's, it's still, we, we've stabilized it. We've, we've, that, that's, that's really good. And the reason we've stabilized it is because we brought, the top line is, is where we reduced emissions so dramatically, the removal rates become equal, They're equal to the, to the emission rate. So that would be meeting the Paris Agreement. Our emissions do not exceed the rate of removal. However, 450 is still too high to meet the two degree target, but that's, that's another story, right? We've got, to, we've got to then figure out, is there a way to bring it down lower? And it turns out uh, that there is. So you look at, at uh, what's happening, where it says biomass, what they really mean by that is forest lands and soils, and it isn't just forests, it's, it's, it's everything that grows. It's grasslands, it's, it's wetlands, it's everything. But we don't have a, you, you, you don't, there's not a little, little, um, uh, label on every carbon dioxide molecule that tells you where it's coming from and where it's going. So they can just aggregate it. So <clears throat> here's an idea. Suppose we were to plant a bunch of trees or somehow increase the amount of forests that we have and that sequestration piece there is the growth of those forests lands, right? Growing forests, growing more trees somewhere, somehow. And what does that do to our level here? Well, not surprisingly, it brings it down. Because now, the removal rate exceeds the input rate. You can see where this is going from my title, right? Um, so it, so it took an 80% reduction in fossil fuel emissions, and then we planted uh, enough trees or let trees grow or did something to remove another 1.6 billion tons of carbon per year. So that's what it takes. Remember, we're putting 10 in. We're taking, we're taking five and a half out. With this, we reduce from the 10 to two, and we plant trees, and we are now headed that back down uh, we're, it's slow, but we're doing something, and maybe we could do twice that amount of planting or growth, and if we go down faster, and that's the strategy I want to talk to you about. But first we have to look at realities. The forests of the world have not been treated well by humans. The dark green represents um, the um, intact for remaining intact forests in the world, and the light green represents um, what it was 8,000 years ago. So at the end of the last ice age, there's, there's a study just came out in 2014 that estimates that there are half as many trees on the planet now as there were 8,000 years ago. Half as many trees. Yes. Intact equals undisturbed? Yes. Yes, it means, it means that it's, uh, it's still the original old growth forest, right, of whatever type it is. It could be a boreal forest or a tropical forest or our temperate forest, whatever it is. Notice that in the United States, there's not much. There's, there's only just barely 1% 
of original old growth forest in the United States, the lower 48. There's some in Alaska, but in the lower 48, we have cut it all at least once, much of it twice, three times, four times. Um, and, uh, and we continue to, continue to, to harvest it. I find this to be a remarkable slide. At the time the Puritans arrived on Cape Cod and at Plymouth, this was the forest coverage. Notice this, it's old growth forest and unseated Native American land in the US. What that means is, to turn it around, those are the lands we took from the Native Americans. If it was unseated, I mean, we, we didn't seed it to them. Of course, it was theirs to begin with. But nevertheless, it was, we've, we've, we've done, so, so the, the, the brown areas are areas that, that, that the Native Americans had in 1620 um, that were not forested. By 1850, the eastern United States looks like it has uh, chicken pox or something. You know, it is, it is or, or, or it's a, it's a, it's a moth-eaten blanket of forest. 1850. If you look up here where, where Massachusetts is, it was almost completely cleared, except for basically this very western part of, of, of the state. But it was really cut back. There was very little original forest left. By 1926, that's all gone. It's just, it's, it's, it's gone. Uh, by 1990, it's really, there is, there is not much of the original forest left anywhere in the lower 48. <clears throat> well, this is just showing the areas that were covered and what happened since about 1850. And notice that the South has seen the biggest decline from about, say, 135 million hectares uh, down to uh, maybe 90, 89 or something. Big drop. In the Northeast, in the North, we saw a drop that bottomed out around 1920, and then we've come back a little bit, but it has not really changed much since just before World War II. So we've not, not made much progress in area. And if you look at area, a map of the Northeast, well, I look at this, what a lot of forest there is, right? Those are all forest lands in the uh, forest cover in the Northeast. Um, we're down, you can see the Quabbin Reservoir, right here. Oh, sorry, right here, right here. There's the Quabbin, there's the Quabbin. Yeah. So that's, so here we are. The, the Connecticut River, you can see where that is, and you can see what's west of it, and you can see what's east of it, and there's a fair amount of cover. But if you look at a different measure, which is carbon density in forests, this is, of course, false colors, uh, but um, this is a, an attempt to find out how much carbon is stored in the forests in this region. Look at Maine. It's bright pink. That's 40 tons per hectare, which is about something like, uh, like uh, 15 or 18 tons per acre. Look at western Massachusetts. It's the deep green, 130, about 60 tons per acre. Why are our forests three times, have three times more carbon in them than Maine? What? Well, in Maine, they've had a pulp and paper industry since uh, the beginning of time, or <laughs> the beginning of settlement. And it's been cut over and cut over and cut over. I was up there giving a talk recently, and I was asking about this, and they said, I said, well, why can't they start a, you know, a, an industry where you make two-by-fours? I mean, we're importing all our two-by-fours from Canada, from Quebec or someplace. Why can't they grow them in Maine? They said there are not enough trees in Maine that are big enough to cut a two by four out of. They have been so, they're so, the trees are all so young, and the soil has become so depleted that it's not regrowing. Just one other thing I, I just noticed the other day as I was putting this together. If you take Massachusetts and turn it on its side, to turn it 90 degrees, 
and lay it on top of Vermont, there's almost as much carbon stored in Massachusetts as there is in Vermont. I thought that was a really interesting, interesting observation, and I hope you do too. <laughs> Um, and and um, and and that there's this you know you can see the Adirondack uh, forever wild right here, right? So that's been regrowing. What was that? 1898 or something like that? What? 94. Okay, think. I knew I'd have an expert in the audience who could straighten me out on that. But anyway, since the end of the 19th century, you're not allowed to now to do forestry in there, so it's forever wild. Well, but not, not, not on, a, on a big commercial scale. It's the, there are areas that have, there are areas in there that have to be left un, uncut. I don't know, and Bob, you maybe have the answer to this, but in Western Massachusetts, I think we just forgot to cut it, right? <laughs> well, about, about why we have so much more carbon density than most of the rest of, of, uh, of Maine and other parts of the East. What? Well, that's right. I mean, Savoy, Savoy Strait State Forest and Mohawk Trail State Forest are kind of up and down. Uh, but it was cut at one time, most of it. But there are patches out there that are, that are I mean, I, I discovered a, uh, when I first started teaching at Williams many years ago, um, Hank Art of the biology department, we were both young whippersnapper professors, and at town meeting there was this uh, motion to uh, 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 allow the cutting of uh, the hemlocks on the, uh, Stone Hill, which was a town-owned woodlot, and uh, we couldn't figure out what's this. Well, they needed $5,000 because the Conservation Commission had overspent $5,000, and so they were going to do this. And we went out and looked at it. Here were these trees, which probably dated to the time of the American Revolution, the settlement of Williamstown, and they were all going to be cut down. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. We, we teamed up with local, you know, here we are, we're the outside, you know how it is in a college town, right? They're the, they're, they're, they're the town, town group, and then there's the college group. And we teamed up with, we, just, we made a discovery. We had a walk, people came, and there's a stone bench there. It turns out, many a proposal was made at that stone bench. <laughs> and we won. <laughs> Love conquers all. <laughs> Just don't forget that. So here's the situation. We have all of this here, but that's just the beginning of the story, as you'll see. So let me just show you a few other things. We all know that a lot of bad stuff is going on in, in our forests. Uh, fire, look at the fire in the upper right there in the west, uh, losses. Wind damage from hurricanes and things in, in uh, uh, Louisiana and, and East Texas, drought in parts of the country, insect damage. Those bark beetles in the west are just damaging trees like mad. Converted means converted from forests to other uses like agriculture. But this is the loss of carbon from harvesting in the upper left. And you add it all up and it looks like this. What's really astounding is that the emissions from harvesting, the, the, the carbon that's released, that's lost because of that, is about equal to the total fossil fuels used by the entire building industry, that is, residential and commercial buildings in the United States. It's never talked about. It's, it does not appear in the numbers. Everybody says, oh, we have, we're doing fine because our forests are offsetting 11 to 13% of our fossil fuel emissions. But then they don't count the emissions that come from the harvesting. And by the way, 11 to 13% is half, less than half of what it is for the global average. So we're well, unlike Lake Wobegon, we are well below average here. This is, this is where we are. So this is, um, and, and th these are, um, so you can just see it here. Uh, there are the different categories. The red is just from harvesting. Everything else is insects, fire, wind, drought, and conversion. So that's something that needs to be dealt with. Now, meanwhile, over in Europe, there was this headline while I was there last just a year ago. 
UK carbon emissions fall to 19th century levels as government phases out coal. Wow. Here is the data. They show this in inside. I mean, it was, in, it was actually in the um, Times of London. <clears throat> so here we are, back in 1850. We're down here at whatever that number is, and <clears throat> and um, and by the time you get up to 1900, you see the line. That's the current level. So that's why we're in the in the in the um, in there. By the way, notice that they do typos too. United Kingdom CO2 emissions fell to 381 metric tons. No, it's 381 million metric tons. All right. Uh, the lowest non-strike level since 1894. Country's dramatic reduction in coal use is the main driver of the post-1990 drop in CO2. Now, I've worked with a lot of European scientists on climate change, and we've worked together on all sorts of things. And they're so excited that Europe is racing to get out of fossil fuels. But what they're doing is substituting wood and burning it in huge power plants. This is the biggest coal plant in Europe. And they now have converted two thirds of it to burn wood. And it's wood pellets. And the wood pellets all come from the US and a little bit from Canada. <sighs> Didn't we fight the Brits over something like this once before? I mean, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, here we are. So Drax, this was in 2014-2015, in, uh, 2015, about 4.8 million tons. It's now up to almost 6 million tons a year. Uh, and they count it all as zero. They call it carbon neutral. Now, I'm a chemist. And if I burn cellulose, you know, wood, wood fiber, it's made up of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And it reacts with oxygen and it forms carbon dioxide and water, just like coal does. In fact, it has about the same carbon dioxide emission intensity as coal does for heat. The yeah, BTU, carbon dioxide per BTU, if you like, is, is the same. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says the uh, car greenhouse gas emissions from burning biomass are comparable to fossil fuels. That's the first sentence in their section on it. If you make electricity with it, it's 50 to 70 percent more carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. But it's zero on the books because the regulations say it's zero. Now, before we get too smug about this, the US Congress has passed a similar law that says for all forest bioenergy shall be considered carbon neutral by all federal agencies. That was put in by our friends Susan Collins and Angus King up in Maine, because they're trying to revive this dead forest industry. There's a lot of unemployment. There's a lot of suffering up there. So I understand the motivation. But we're not looking to find new uses for coal to restore the coal industry in West Virginia. We're trying to find other things for people to do and have an economy there. We should be doing the same thing in Maine. And. Massachusetts, with our great Global Warming Solution Act and everything else, has been moving in the direction more and more of counting all bioenergy as either carbon neutral or simply ignoring it. And I'll talk about that right at the end. So basically, this is just showing that round wood, whole trees, is the big source. And I'm going to just, this is just showing the growth in these pellets and exports. And then I'm going to show you. Um, some of the following pictures may be disturbing. These were taken in North Carolina, which is the source of all this wood pellet production. I was just down there 10 days ago, or 12 days ago. Uh, this has been going on now for, started about eight years ago. And this is what happens when you have a pellet industry in the area. So the pellet industry has cut this down. Um, and uh, there it is. That's what it looks like after they've been through. This is a direct quotation from the Inviva website, which is the website of the company that, um, that, that makes the pellets. 
Wetland forests and Viva supplies, suppliers take extra care by using specialized harvesting equipment and techniques that minimize environmental impacts and protect soil and water quality. There it is. Pretty stunning. Um, Drax, the company that burns the pellets in the UK, we never cause deforestation. It's on their website. Well, now they're saying, well, you know, uh, to, uh, clear cuts are just a, a, a management system. And we're, we're, we're uh, and, and you don't understand. You see, we take sawdust that's left over from sawmills. They're cutting the big trees into wood that goes into house buildings. The sawdust collected, it's made into a pellet. An NGO down there called Dogwood Alliance followed from the cutting to loading the trucks to following the trucks directly into the Inviva plant. And uh, there was a British film crew there for a, a channel in, in London uh, doing this for a British audience. So I was absolutely delighted to see that they were doing that. Here's an aerial picture of Inviva. And you can see they do have a lot of sawdust, but it comes from grinding up all these whole trees. These are all trees. These are whole trees. All of that is whole trees. And so they don't just use sawdust and forest residues. Here's another picture of it. So you can see, um, you can see the whole thing laid out. It's pretty extraordinary. 850,000 green tons a year from this one plant alone in North Carolina. There are three of them in eastern North Carolina. They're trying to build a fourth. And where are these all built? In low-income communities of color. And I was invited to a, to a panel discussion down there uh, last um, September. And um, this woman who's uh, an African-American woman who's in one of these communities and a spokesperson for them just gave the most eloquent plea. The amount of asthma and things that their children suffer from this is horrible. Uh, the air pollution is awful. And they're just destroying the whole area around where these people live. Now, we can think about how we might do this differently. One thing would be not to use bioenergy. Bioenergy is not carbon neutral. As I said, it's more intense, intensive, carbon intensive than coal. And if your goal is to make electricity, you can make it with solar panels, right? And solar panels, the last time I looked, don't emit any carbon dioxide at all. And let me just share one other little calculation we did. So you look at the efficiency of the conversion of wood heat to electricity, and at the very best, it's 25%. So you get one quarter of the heat energy converted to electrical energy. But that wood was made with solar energy. And the photosynthetic efficiency of sunlight energy to combustible heat energy is about 1% in a forest. So the efficiency from solar energy to electricity is one quarter of 1% of the energy. You can go out and buy solar panels today that are 20% efficient. One quarter compared to 20 is a factor of 80. In other words, you could put solar panels on a piece of land and you'd have to have a forest 80 times that size to manage it consistently to get enough wood to keep that plant going. And it would be emitting things all along. And by the way, it's cheaper to buy solar panels than to do this. So why are they doing it? Imagine cutting it, making the pellets, shipping them across the ocean, trucking them to the site, and burning them. $1.2 billion in subsidies goes a long way to making it economically feasible. So a group of us got together, wrote letters to the European Parliament that was about to vote on this. We got, we got um, 796 scientists from Europe and the US to say it's not carbon neutral and it's not a good idea. And um, they voted some very weak amendments which basically are unenforceable. So this will continue for the next, till 2030 at the rate they're going. All right, well, let's start looking at the bright side. Well, we can, you know, we can plant, we can, we can plant some more trees. I mean, 
Here you can see there's uh, planted forest or integrated in the natural forest here. You can sort of see where it was cut over before. Uh, I'm afraid this looks an awful lot like a monoculture to me, but at least it's trees. Uh, we can plant more trees. We can, we can restore uh, degraded forests. Um, so this is what our typical New England forest looks like now. And I'm going to ask Bob Leverett to come up here and talk about what this might grow into, because here is a novel idea. We don't have a lot of open land that we could add new forests to, or even that were formerly forests that we could put back in forest. There's just not a, lot, not, not a huge amount of that land. We can, we can take an area that's been cut over, and we can replant it, and we can have, in another 100 years, we'll have a forest there. But Bob, if you want to come up and just show, if we allowed these young trees, these are young trees. These trees are, are, I don't know, 30, 40 years old, maybe. That one, of course, is older. That's a bigger one. There are a few bigger ones in here. But what would happen if we allowed this to grow? And I'm just going to show you some photos that Bob has taken. He is the master of of the um, of, of the, uh, the 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 trees and forests of Massachusetts, and knows. I'm going to show you some of his best friends here. Thank, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, Bill. And uh, I, when Bill asked me to uh, narrate on the images, and he'd asked for some some pictures to sort of showcase what we have, you know, it didn't take me long to. Uh, go through my, my list and, and choose the ones I thought that told the greatest stories. And the story that they tell is something that you don't really read very much about. In fact, most people really don't know that we have such trees. But the one over on the left is a white pine growing Mohawk Trail State Forest. We started measuring that tree back in uh, 1992. Jack Sobin and myself, we used a surveyor transit then. We've climbed it four times, tape drop measured it, and now we measure it with high precision lasers. It happens to be 175 feet in height and as such is the tallest living thing we know of in all of New England. And it's still growing. It's about 150, 160 years old. It holds about 670, 680 cubic feet in the trunk alone. It's been a working tree for the environment. Uh, that's in Franklin County, but we're here in Hampshire County. We don't want to be left out. Do we have anything to crow about? Well, yeah, the trustees' property over at uh, the Bryant Homestead, Cummington, Mass., we've got a, a, the Bryant White Pine there. We keep uh, uh, tabs on it. It's 164 feet, so it becomes a 50-meter tree. It's about the same circumference as the two. It's a little less, but it's a little younger. But Good grief, folks, 164 feet is about 15 stories. Where did such trees come from? Well, we've got them, and they're in small pockets, but they really show us what Western Massachusetts can produce. And you really won't read that in, in silvicultural journals or anything like that. It takes a bunch of very obsessed people uh, to, to want to do this, and my wife will attest I'm obsessed. <clears throat> So what else can we see there? Is it just white pines? No, here's the state champion Bryant, uh, on Bryant property again, the trustee's property. It's a black cherry. Most of us know the species, and it's, it's not particularly large or impressive. Well, this is the state champion. It's a little over nine foot circumference, about 100 feet in height, and it's totally emergent. Uh, my, Jared and, and Ray here flew a quadcopter over the top, and you look at it and you think, hey, that's a rainforest type of a tree. But it's not in, it's not in South America, it's, it's here in Massachusetts. Where do these trees hide? Where do you hide something like that? And nobody seems to, to know about it. Well, uh, this is one, you see my friend Will Blozan from uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina. We were climbing this great tree here. And that's the Henry David Thoreau white pine. My friend um, Rich Higgins wrote a book, a recent book, about uh, Thoreau in the trees. And he really went nuts over this one. Uh, it's 13.3 it's feet in circumference and 160 feet tall. It's almost 200 years old. And it's still growing. And it's in, it's in a forest that is partially old growth 
We have about 1,200 acres of old growth left in Massachusetts, and I think we know every single tree in it. <clears throat> well, we don't want to leave out the towns. Here, here's uh, the state champion Eastern Cottonwood, Populus Deltoides, on uh, I think it's Columbus Avenue, uh, just across the Houstonic River, Hoosick River, sorry, in, in, uh, in Pittsfield. And we've been keeping close tabs on that. It's 24 feet in circumference, about 86 feet in height. But again, these trees are monumental in size and in the work they, they do for the environment. Now, most people think cottonwoods don't live that long. Well, they don't. But a lot of them live over 200 years, and a few of them will live over 300 years. And if you can think of a tree that's getting up to that size and holding that much carbon, it's a working freak. Oh, I don't know who this guy is, but don't, don't look at him too long. We don't want to forget Smith College. Now, I'm a proud uh, uh, member of the tree committee here on, on Smith College, and uh, we, we've got four state champions. But this is a tree that just does well, I wouldn't say it doesn't get any respect. I just say that very, not very many people really even think about it. It's on the Lyman estate. It's a tulip tree, Liriodendron tulipifera, and it's about 13.2 feet in circumference, about 130 or 132 feet in height, and it continues to grow. Well, I wanted to show you that because if you can see other tulip trees in here and then there are other species, nobody pays attention to that. But that uh, some of these places, people walk by these trees all the time without us really thinking about them. But when you take a tree that's been that size and it's been around for a couple of hundred years or more, Think about the ecological services that it provides. And uh, our own Northampton Look Park. How many people have gone there, walked and whatnot? Well, I know every one of those pines and I measure them. I won't tell you I put mar miracle grow at the base of them. <laughs> Just keep that one. Right. But we've got a tree in here It's 140, uh, almost 142 feet in height. If you look at the books and whatnot, you, you won't get the, any idea that we have anything like that. So I'm on sort of a crusade to try to get these exceptional places up in the consciousness of people so that we really have something to be proud of, but we also recognize the value that they, that they offer us. Well, I think that was, oh, yes, yes, yes. And that is the great Sunderland sycamore. Now, one of the things I do sort of on the sidelines, I measure these trees for the state. And this one is the great Sunderland sycamore. You can see pictures of it in the late 1890s, and it was a big tree then. It's 25.8 feet in circumference, about 112 and a half feet in height, and it has an average cran spread of about 135 or 136 feet. It probably holds 3,000 cubic feet of wood in its trunk and limbs. You can take 3,000 cubic feet, multiply it by the density. For, for that species, it's about 28 pounds per cubic foot, and then about 0.48 or so percent of that, 0.48, is, is carbon. You can figure out how much carbon this beast is holding in it, and it is really a lot. That tree is doing a lot for the environment. Good. Well, thank you very much. But Bob is my favorite tree wrapper. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yes. I have a question for Bob uh, while he's, you know, doing yeah. the presentation. Uh, I've heard recently that the composition of New England forest is changing, and there are a lot more beech trees than there used to be. With yes. Beach. Could you speak beech trees? Beech. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is increasing. That's what I mean. um, so what, is that, what would that entail in terms of forest management? Uh, because I, I don't that's a problem with deer spreading it, etc. I, I guess I'm not sure I understand where you're going with that. Okay. You say, you, what are you asking? Should we be managing or controlling the birch? Yes, because they're definitely taking over from trees like these that would grow much. Let's talk about that. Okay. okay. All right. Good. Good. 
Okay, so you see, you, you see, the, you, you see where, I've, where I've taken you. Um, we have this wonderful, what is it, 100, 130 tons per, um, per, uh, per hectare of density of carbon in Western Massachusetts average, but our average trees are small. Look what they could grow into. And when I talk to certain foresters, they say, well, we got to harvest over mature trees. They're talking about trees that are 70 years old. That's over mature in their book. And the difference of the way things happen is, is enormous. Um, and if we could just allow the trees we have to grow to this size, double or triple the amount of carbon that we're already storing without going outside the boundaries of the existing forest, that'd be a pretty good thing to do. Yes? If, if the concern is, so we're already right through to not take like Maine in Northern Vermont, correct? So we're kind of in a good place. And so if the concern is that we want removals to be for, um, to be in balance yes. do the trees at that size, I understand that they contain mm -hmm. to sequester carbon at a fairly high rate. In fact, my friends over at uh, Harvard Forest are showing that they're actually speeding up their growth as they go on, as they get older. And of course, uh, the, the amount of carbon they're going to store is, is the proportional to the leaf mass or area. And you, these bigger trees are going to have more of that. So, so they're going to continue to pull carbon out of the air. Now, if you take a very small, well, if you take a very, very small, tiny, tiny tree, uh, it may be growing at a very r rapid rate. That's true. Percentage-wise, it's growing at a rapid rate. But how much are you, you going to get carbon-wise out of a tiny tree or a small part? It's a little bit hard right now, I think, to determine exactly where the curves cross, where rapid growth of younger trees uh, gets, gets uh, uh, counterbalanced you know, against older trees that are larger. I can't give you an exact figure, but it's not what most people think. I mean, most what you tend to hear is you think that it's a very young forest. That's not really the case at all. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's much less. It's it's <clears throat> it's the, people talk about the percentage rate of increase, but a percentage rate of increase of a seedling this big is not very much carbon. It's like saying, do you have a hundred dollars in your bank account or a thousand dollars? And you're putting in $10 every month. Well, the growth rate of the $100 is much greater than the growth rate of the $1,000. But, but you're, you're, you know, it's not, it's not, I'd rather have the $1,000 in my bank account than the $100. And even if I lost some of it, remember, these trees are, are living to be 200, 300 years. If we got two or 300 years worth of, of carbon storage out of these before the wind knocked them down, or on average, whatever it was, we would really be way ahead from where we are. Let me just wrap up here, and then we'll go to questions and answers for everybody. Um, so now there's this proposal <coughs> to have something called the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership, and the red shows the areas we're talking about. It's these towns, um, and um, it's proposed by the state, um, and um, it would uh, see there are about 360,000 acres out here, 82% forested. 60% um, designated as core habitat and critical natural landscape and so on. And this proposal would be a management plan. Uh, here are all the towns showing exactly which ones they are, um, a little bit north of here. Uh, but it would, um, uh, it talks about, the legislation talks about conservation and so on according to a, and according to a plan. 
Well, I was curious about this, so I looked at the makeup of the board that runs this thing and discovered that it was the U.S. Forest Service, and it was uh, an organization uh, that when you go to their website, they advocate making wood pellets for heat. And so my experience in North Carolina, my experience in what's going on in Maine, I sort of feel like we're in a pincer movement here from the south and the north. This would not be good. Maine is trying to create a port in Portland, Maine to ship more pellets to Europe. The US Forest Service has an old office whose job is to increase exports of wood products from the United States. They're trying to open up trade with China to sell our wood pellets, our forests to China. So here is something that will give you a sense of proportion. If you look at the, at, uh, at the difference between different parts of the country, the south, the green line, has very few trees that are 100 years old. They've all just been taken out, and they're just taken out over and over again. Our um, situation here, the purple line, is that uh, we, our, our maximum is about you know, 75 years. That's kind of the maximum. Those trees have hundreds of years to grow if we let them grow. So there's a huge opportunity to have additional carbon sequestration, and we get a bunch of other fringe benefits in there as well. And to come to your point about the size, there's always talk about we'll do sustainable forestry. So we cut down an existing forest, and we plant little trees. And if you manage them on a 60-year rotation, in the southeast it's a 25-year rotation, then this is the amount of carbon that's stored in those two different forests, right? Almost, well, two and a half times or something more in the old forest than in this sustainably managed forest that we cut down every 60 years because those trees are smaller. And if you look at why that happens, this is a simulation sort of thing. So the carbon stored in the forest is on the left, that green line going to the top. So then it's cut. And then you do a plantation or something, and the trees grow, and the carbon goes into them, and then you cut them, and again, and you cut them. And the difference between the, where the green area is and the gray area is the carbon that's forever in the atmosphere from the initial cutting. So it does not uh, make it a good idea to do that. Now, we know that's wrong in Indonesia and in the tropics, in tropical countries, where they take these beautiful tropical forests and turn them into palm oil plantations so that we can every single, look at prepared foods. Every prepared food has palm oil in it. Almost every cosmetic has palm oil in it. And in Europe, all, a lot of the biodiesel has palm oil. They just, it burns like it, just like, better than diesel fuel. So the Indonesians are making a lot of money doing this, but look at this terrible conversion. And by the way, the climate treaty says we ought to do something about forests in the tropics. But what do we do? We take a forest that looks like that in North Carolina and turn it into this. Now, where do you think there's more carbon stored? Just look at this picture, right? The one on the left has a lot more. And so this will be, this will be harvested about every 25 years. That's 25-year growth right there, probably. So it is really a bad deal <laughs> to do that. And so um, I just wanted to close by saying that um, in this act, they talk about finally you discover that there's a plan hidden in the legislation that's just mentioned as a plan. You go and read the plan for this Mohawk Trail partnership, and the word pellet appears 38 times in the report. And we were told over and over, oh, there's nothing about wood pellets here. There's nothing about it. You just, it's right there in plain sight. So there are people who are working against this, and if you care about this, you may want to talk to some of them. Some of them are here in the room. They'll be out, I think, outside, handing things out. We have some, there's some handouts here uh, that people might want to take with them. Um, so um, <laughs> there are no climate scientists uh, on this, uh, consulted on this. And here's <clears throat> um, a state, it's states, Massachusetts, but the Forest Service is going to give us all this money to do it. And they are on the board that decides. And if you go in, there's no, no way to get out. It's a, well, if you, if you become part of this partnership, there's no way, if you decide you don't like it, if the town of Peru doesn't like it, you can't, you can't withdraw. There's no, no provision for withdrawing. 
So it's a pretty, I don't know, I think it's troubling legislation. I've worked on policy for many years, and I think this is poorly drawn policy, or maybe it isn't poorly drawn. Maybe there's a reason for it. So instead, if you did something that was much more about promoting our forests and what they're useful for ecologically, sure, there'll be some, some harvesting of something, but keep it small and local. Uh, that might work. And then there's this um, alternative Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. We've been talking with him. He said that he would do that. The problem is at the meeting where the participants said they were doing that, they said, uh, "We'll take it out now. We can always put it back in later." All right. So you know, I think I, I congratulate uh, uh, Representative Smyzik and others for doing that, but it's no guarantee that it stops the problem. Um, Department of uh, uh, Energy Resources uh, 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 came out, in, well, they, over the fall, they had this whole thing about promoting wood chips and, bio, and pellets and giving subsidies for it. And they're big subsidies. So basically, each of these towns would get money and a free big boiler to heat their schools or their municipal buildings, you know, you could spend about one-tenth that amount and insulate these buildings really well, and it would create local jobs. These industries don't create jobs. Pellet factories don't create a lot of jobs. So anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a hugely problematic thing. They released it on December 29th, and um, I don't know where this is going, but it's really troubling. Uh, it, 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 they, were, they, they heard from hundreds of people, and many in the scientific community like me who said it was a really bad idea. So let me just close with, not the whole world is not going crazy on this. At the climate meeting in December, um, this was a statement that was made. Sustaining and increasing forest is vital to get on track in time to meet the Paris Climate Change Agreement's goal to keep the average temperature below two degrees and if possible below one and a half. This is written by a Brit, obviously, the maths plural, uh, of climate science show that meeting this goal is impossible without nurturing forests, which, form, which from, uh, from the atmosphere's point of view are a massive sink of carbon locked up in trees, plants, and the soil, and a source of oxygen through photosynthesis. Now, this is, these are diplomats speaking. They seem to do better than our politicians in getting this right. And then... The director of the International Union of the Conservation of Nature goes even further. Our planet's forests are being decimated at an alarming rate. Putting a stop to this destruction is crucial to tackling climate change, reducing poverty, and feeding a growing global population in line with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Nature-based solutions such as protecting and restoring forests can contribute over one-third of the total climate change mitigation required by 2030 to keep the temperature rise below two degrees. More decisive collective action is now needed to seize this opportunity. There it is. That says it about as clearly as I can imagine saying it, that um, it's not possible to d address climate change without dealing with forests. If we don't use forests, we don't get there. One third of all the human added, all the carbon dioxide added by humans to the atmosphere came from for for deforestation and soil degradation. Rightly, we're focusing on cutting out fossil fuels, but we also, it's fine to cut down on the faucet, but we also have to open the drain. Thank you. So we have a little over a half hour for Q&A, and um, we have uh, about 250 people here, and I'd like to spread the questions around the room. So if you can keep your questions short and not make a policy statement, that would be wonderful. If you need to uh, speak up, or I'll give you the mic. I'll bring the mic. Speak to the importance of urban forests, please. Uh, 
<coughs> urban forest. Uh, <coughs> by the way, I might just say, if you, if you look at uh, the, the fact that uh, some of those big trees are in parks, I hope that someday it's not like going to the Sioux to see the last uh, living example. Uh, I mean, it's great that we have them in the parks, but what it does, it demonstrates what we could have in our forest. Now, urban, urban trees play a somewhat... Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, urban please, trees play a somewhat different role. They do store some carbon, but there are just not that many of them. But what they do is they evaporate water and they cool. And it, there was a, I just learned of this uh, from somebody at the state. When they had that, um, um, what was it, Asian longhorn beetle evident, uh, outbreak in Worcester and they had to cut down thousands of trees, somebody had the clever idea to find out what the electrical consumption in the summer was in that region the summer before and the summer after. It was almost 40% more electricity used in the summer after those trees were gone than before. So they, they really do cool. Uh, they block the sun from hitting the dark pavement if they overhang the streets. They provide a number of other functions in addition to how much ever carbon they actually store. Say, I didn't hear you say anything about the dead trees. Uh, I've been to virgin forests, and you can, in many of them, you can't walk around because there's dead wood everywhere. And that, it seems to me, that's a vital part of the ecosystem. There's a whole, there's so many animals and things are dependent upon all the grubs and the insects and everything that lives in them, and yet we've t just sucked that out of even the forests we have in Massachusetts, all that is gone. And that's carbon as well. Yeah, I mean, a, a dead tree is, is uh, the argument you'll hear is, well, those trees will just die, they'll fall down, and they'll rot and put carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. But where do you think humus and soil comes from? Yeah, some of it does go as carbon dioxide into the air, but but some of it goes into humus, which is long, long-term storage in the soils. And as you saw, soils are the big stores of our carbon stocks. But they do it because plants drop their leaves that decay, they drop their branches that decay, and so forth. And as you say, they provide an ecological purpose. There are all kinds of creatures that make that, make that survive. And a forest does not survive as a bunch of trees. Um, have any of you read the, the wonderful book, little book, uh, The Hidden Life of Trees? You know, this is by a German forester who discovered after all the things he was doing that he didn't understand what a forest was. And this, you know, recent last 25 years maybe discovery that the mycelium, the little fungal threads in the soil, actually allow for communication between and among trees and increases the health of the forest and the growth rate of the forest and the carbon sequestration of the forest, much more than if you just plant all one species of tree in a, in a, in a tree farm. Uh, another point about that is that the, uh, the coarse woody debris, as we often call it, uh, down logs in various states of decay have a, an amazing amount of water in them that hold, that keep the forest floor much cooler and wetter. And in a film that uh, my friend here, Ray Astle and I are doing on old growth forests in New England, uh, we, we had one of our scientist friends uh, uh, come out in, in part of it. And, and he reached down and in talking about the coarse woody debris of the logs, he reached down and he pulled out some of the uh, a rotting log, and he held his hand up and he squeezed it, and it just drained water out. And and now, if you go into a cutover forest, what happens? It, land dries out. Big yeah. difference. Yep. Well, I have two questions. One is, do you really think that the forest is Biomass plant, has that stopped? 
I, I don't know the details of what that is, but I heard some terrible news on the, on, the, on the radio yesterday that the city of Boston is going to meet its carbon neutral goals by resorting to biomass, forest biomass. And there is a consultant going around telling all these cities that they need to get biomass generated electricity and then they can count it as carbon neutral because trees grow back. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. I don't know the state of the status of the uh, Springfield plant at all, but uh, I know that the state of Ma Commonwealth of Massachusetts is pushing to get a pellet plant in western Massachusetts. You saw on that one graph that, there, that, that land conversion is, is, is significant. It's agriculture and urbanization or suburbanization. That's where we lose, I don't know, 4% of the carbon that we lose from the forests every year to, to those conversions, 3 or 4%, whatever the number is. Um, but, you know, you're talk, when you're talk, we're trying to uh, convince people of, um, of ways to, um, uh, to live more sustainably. Uh, I think there's several things. One is get the information out there, and then I guess the other is we need to set an example. a good question. I think there'll have to be, uh, uh, and, they're, and they'll come with very wet feet when they arrive, that's for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes? Um, I have a quick question and then a comment. Sure. The question is, when you gave you the graph early on about emissions uh, stabilizing for the last few years, was that based on counting all the bioenergy as zero? No, yes, absolutely. It was only fossil, that was fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions. So they were really going up. Yes, okay. yes. So, so we've actually opened the faucet a little bit more and we have shut down the drain because when the trees aren't growing to take it up, they're not taking up as much. My comment is, um, I wonder if one low-hanging fruit that would seem to make a lot of sense is on public forests, Massachusetts is about 20% public forest. Um, White Mountain National Forest, that kind of thing. They're, they're less than 20% of all of New England. Really, it's 10% or so. Those lands are logged, including clear cutting, um, at a public loss. So we're actually paying, right. not, not only are we chopping the forest down, clear cutting and setting it to Quebec, but we're actually paying to do so, paying for the privilege. We even do that in Northampton, where they're paying to log on the drinking watersheds in Northampton currently, as we speak. So I'm just wondering, you know, maybe the low-hanging fruit in this effort is stop logging public lands, save money, and save carbon. We, we could also save a lot of taxpayer money by not giving subsidies to right. to cut down trees and burn them, right. and and uh, that would make another. Yeah, it's all it's all of a, of a piece. I mean, I've been trying to convince the taxpayers of, the, of Great Britain that they're really wasting a lot of money to send those subsidies to do those pellets. Uh, a whole bunch of us are working on that. But yes, let's make sure that we're spending our, our hard earned trip. That's right, yeah. Well, a few more of those examples and getting those out there and you know, making that information known, I think we could maybe start a movement. There's a lady back there, yes. Yes. Well, I mean, I've understood, obviously, about the problems with burning biomass. What I can't understand is how the state can continue to get people to believe that burning biomass is carbon neutral. I mean, that is just, most kids could understand that. I don't understand how the state can spread lies and everyone believes them. 
I think this is a huge political problem, um, and I don't see how we're going to be able to move forward. I mean, I was a tax resistor years ago, and I mean, I don't know how we're going to be able to move forward without a huge movement soon. I don't. I wish there. I wish that we could trust government, but it's in the hands of big. It's in the hands of big corporations. So, of course, they're really good at public relations that smother us with lies. You know, I just. It's very difficult to know how to move forward. Right. Well, it is difficult, but um, the. Um uh, it, the, the scientific community is really upset about legislating scientific facts. When, when uh, Senator Collins proposed this uh, biomass thing back several years ago, we got a whole group of scientists to write letters saying that this was, you know, that uh, legislating scientific facts has never been a good idea. You can never find a case, right? You know, you can think about the Lysenko affair in Russia or the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the way in which uh, evolution is taught in schools that it doesn't exist. And you can, you, can, you can make up all these things. But the world has its own way of telling the truth. And the role of science is, is to try to find out what the facts are, what, what is actually happening. And it's really troubling. I mean, not only are grants being cut to do the research, but then you've got these things that take you over the top into saying something like, well, it's carbon neutral, so we'll, so we'll use it. Just because, it's, just because a tree will regrow makes it only slowly renewable. By the way, while it's regrowing, all that, even if you grew it back to the exact tree that was there, and it took 50 years, 100 years, when that tree grows back, the carbon dioxide that was in the air extra all the time melted a glacier somewhere. It um, caused the warming of the permafrost and it let out some methane, which gave a feedback. The sea level rose. Those things don't go back just because you got to carbon neutrality. So a phrase I've been using in some of my presentations and things is uh, uh, carbon neutral is not climate neutral. Climate, it's climate neutrality we want. We don't want, in fact, we want Climate, we want to go negative. We, climate neutral is not good enough because we are going to have way too many of these things happening. Excuse me. That's right. That sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lady over here that's had her hand up a long time. Right there. Yes. Hi, thank you. This is fabulous um, information. My question is about the relative benefits of trees in the tropics versus in <laughs> climates such as ours. I live in Connecticut, but I was born in the Philippines. So if I want to help by planting trees or preventing deforestation, where is it as important for me to help my relatives in the Philippines keep planting there or preventing deforestation there, as well as planting trees in my yard? Great question. Uh, trees grow much faster in the tropics. There's no question about it. They grow about twice as fast you know, well, it's year-round, right? You don't, have, you don't have what we call mud season, for example, in the tropics. You don't have winter. You don't have mud season. So the trees grow year-round, so they do grow faster. Uh, unfortunately, um, the tropical forests are in pretty bad shape right now, and the Philippines was largely deforested in order to send logs to Japan. I had a colleague, uh, economist, who did a study of that, and he discovered that twice as many logs were arriving in Japan as were shipped from the Philippines. They must have bred or something on board the ship. <laughs> I mean, it was obviously fraud, right? I mean, they, 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 they weren't honest about what they were doing. And so the Philippines has been heavily deforested. So helping them reforest would be great, provided you can be sure that the current administration there won't then just say, well, we'll cut them down and sell twice as many as we say we export. So we have to be careful with that. But I think there's, it would be, I mean, the, the thing I've been trying to do is we've all got the message that the tropics or tropical forests are in trouble. What we have not gotten the message of is that American forests are also in trouble, right? We, and, and, and that our forests are important. In fact, the regrowth of the Northeast forest after deforestation and then the agriculture was abandoned starting Around 1850, I guess, when people discovered Ohio and you could go and farm and not farm rocks, 
right? It was a, it was a real discovery. <laughs> it was a real discovery. Um, and, and so, you know, so that's, that's, that's 150 years ago when that started. And it went through the end of World War, uh, World War II to 1950, say. So basically, we have trees that are, we saw the peak is around 75 years of age. That's the, what the trees are here because that's when we stopped farming some of these, these pretty marginal agricultural soils and let it go back to trees. But we're now just deliberately destroying them. And so I would say, as if you're here, you do what you can do as an American, and we can still help people in other countries as well. Yes? It's a good question. Oh, the, que oh, the question was, do palm oil plantations absorb carbon dioxide? And of course they do, because you know they do photosynthesis like every other self-respecting tree does. But it, what, what is stored there is so much less than what was stored in the forest that was taken away that we have this net increase to the atmosphere. Right. How, how long ago? Talking years back. Yeah. Five years ago, seven years ago, something. And, and the green fields, you know, it was people like me who had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> they got together and, and made rockets and, and it didn't happen. convinced them not to do it. Right. I don't know if there's anything to be learned from that. Oh, I think there's a lot to be learned from that. <laughs> we're, we're learning more and more that. Uh, that uh, movements are important. Yes, right yes. I have a suggestion. Uh, well, a question. Uh, I don't know if people in this room are aware, but the DOER, the Department of Energy Resources, which is propagating biomass as an alternative currently, is having listening sessions around the state. And there are two in Western Massachusetts coming up. And I would strongly urge anyone that wants to make a statement against Biomass. Go over there. Yes. You can find them on the DOER website. They run Springfield and they run a picture. Those listening sessions are on the mass same energy efficiency programs with different parts of DOER. Well, if they can still hear that, 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 that that's a good, you know, we do want to, we do want more energy efficiency. We don't want, we don't want this other thing. Yeah. Yes. Biochar is basically charcoal. I mean, it's made from charring plant material. And uh, they discovered in the Amazon that uh, some previous civilization there had put this in the soils, and it really increased the productivity of the Amazonian forest in those areas. Um, the question I have is, I, 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 think, I think it's fine. I mean, I think it's a good, it, you know, it, it all works OK. The problem with it is how much carbon dioxide is released to the atmosphere when you're making biochar. And I've talked to people who are making it, and nobody's been able to give me a good answer on that. But the other thing is, um, you know, 
we'd have to have millions of these units going to make a really big difference. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do some of it, but we, I don't think we can count on that as the answer. Um, you know, there's this, when they discovered, when they were doing the modeling, that we could not meet the goal without negative emissions from somewhere, the, the, the model just said, we've got this deficit of this many billion tons a year we've got to do something with. Somebody came up with the bright idea, well, here's what we do is we, we, we grow forests, we, we manage them sustainably, then we cut them all down and we burn them, and we capture the carbon dioxide and bury it. <laughs> this is going to come out as a serious scientific proposal, and I think it's a disaster, but anyway, it, 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 they totally neglected the fact that for every two power plants you have, you build a third one to capture the carbon from the three of them. And a new paper just came out showing that if you really succeeded at that and you really got to carbon neutrality with it, you would have exceeded the entire freshwater capacity of the earth. All of the biodiversity losses would be mammoth because you need an area the size of Canada to plant to do this on that scale. And just went through, uh, the amount of nitrogen uh, you'd fertilize it. I mean, it just went on and on and on with all the all the the planetary boundaries that would be exceeded. So there are, you know, the nice thing about letting trees grow is it's pretty low maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but you see that 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 is a, that becomes a store in the ground, and w once it's in soil, it's there much more permanently than. I mean, it doesn't get blown down by hurricanes and everything. It's really in there. And uh, both freshwater and saltwater uh, wetlands. I, I just been writing a paper with seven wetland scientists, and uh, I've learned a lot about wetlands. And they've learned a lot, I think, about climate change. And we've had a great collaboration. Uh, but there are some real opportunities in terms of soils, uh, managing soils better. We could, get, we could get a billion tons a year by restoring carbon to agricultural soils. And you, you, for every 1% you increase it by, you get about a 10% increase in productivity. How bad is that? You get better water retention. You know, I mean, it goes on and on. You need less, less fertilizer. You need less, you know, anyway. Yes? Um, it seems like one of the problems, of the major problem um, with um, making the things happen that we need to have happen, the changes that we need to happen is that right now, um, especially in this country, but worldwide, we're in a, a time where everything is monetized. And we don't have a way to monetize the forests except to make pellets out of them or to make timber out of them. You know, so so it's like assigning a value that's not money, which is what we're doing here. We're saying this is incredibly valuable as carbon sink and as a carbon sucker upper forever. <laughs> um, so, but, but that doesn't have a monetary value attached to it. And so the people who are into monetizing everything do not understand the value that we're assigning to these things. And until we can convince them that there are other values besides money, and that they have to start, you know, thinking that those things are valuable or we're all dead, you know, but that's really where we are. I right. mean, we have to be able to translate um, and get them to understand other values besides <coughs> money. I mean, if they could, some, some kind of try to try to monetize human emotions, right? You know, well, that's worth uh, that's worth uh, twelve dollars and forty-seven cents because you do it uh, instead of doing this other thing that would have brought you twelve dollars and forty-seven cents. I mean, it's, so it can get out of control. On the other hand, there is a movement to get a, a price on carbon, and uh, you know, I think that's probably a good idea. But I do worry. I think a forest is is. Um, much more important than just a, a, a forest. Not just, uh, despite all I've said, a forest is not just a carbon sink, right? It's it's, it's yeah. much more than that. I mean, it is that, and that's that that is it, it is exceedingly important for that purpose. But it's also exceedingly important. You know, we're in the sixth extinction, right? 
If we get rid of our forests, that's where, you know, I don't know, 80% of the biodiversity on land is in forests. So the world's not going to work very well if we lose what we're talking about losing in terms of species. So, um, but how do we get them well, well, with elected officials, you don't vote for them if they don't get the point, right? I mean, that's the currency. That's a currency too. Uh, political support is a, is a currency, a kind of currency. So anyway, keep thinking about these things. Good. And so I just wanted to thank you for coming and, and sharing your insights about the, particularly about the chemistry of, of carbon sequestration in forests. And I think your proposal of letting forests grow and, and using that as a way to maximize forests as carbon sinks is really interesting and novel. I also want to um, make the pitch for the family forests, all the people of Massachusetts, the, the, the individual families that own 20 acres, 40 acres, that makes up the most forests, mm -hmm. the most of Massachusetts forests, also in Vermont. So I think I'm thinking about that slide that you showed uh, of, of Maine and Massachusetts, and I, 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 I agree that Maine certainly uh, sees industrial forestry, but I think in Massachusetts and Vermont, for example, there's a lot of great examples of families that have managed their forests well. So I wonder if you can just comment on that kind of giant gradient between shipping for biomass, as you showed in North Carolina, and pulp of paper in Maine, um, but the sustainable forestry, the low impact forestry that many families are doing. Right. And, and then I'll just also say that you know, the land trust movement at large is founded on the idea of willing participants. So there's, there's room for regulation, there's room for uh, advocacy, certainly, but the, the success of the land trust movement is because we, we do monetize the value of protecting land as is. Some landowners choose to do low impact forestry. Some landowners want to do forever wild. And if we can use the cap and trade system, for example, to provide the economic incentive to grow their trees, I'd love to make that happen. Um, but if you could just comment on that spectrum of forestry techniques, that would help, I think. Well, <clears throat> you've, you've correctly uh, laid out the range uh, from uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's cut it and get our money out of it right now and be done with it. These poor people in North Carolina are getting paid something like a dollar a ton. So for an acre they get, you know, a few hundred dollars and it'll be 50 years before they can cut it again if it, if it, if it grows back. I mean, but, but you know, hey, I've got bills to pay. You know, uh, my, uh, I don't have health insurance, and, and, and my, my daughter got sick, and I had to pay her bills. I mean, you understand why it happens. But trying to provide um, uh, ways for people to, um, if, if they need the, the, the economic revenue from the land they have, uh, we all help them out in Massachusetts, you know, uh, by, uh, by giving them a, if they put it in, in the forest management, uh, they get a big local tax reduction, right? But they have to cut it down at some point, or else they come back and take it away from you. Take, you know, you have to pay back all the, those tax abatements that you got, supposedly. Imagine if we paid people to keep the trees standing. And why shouldn't we as taxpayers be willing to do that? Because look at the services, we benefit from that. And yet, most people don't see it that way. You know, why should I help out Joe over there with his land to keep those trees growing? I mean, how boring, they're just growing, you know, it's pretty slow and it's not, not very exciting. Uh, and we could be making money from that. And, uh, and he's getting a tax abatement and, the, and uh, but, but, but there are places where people are paid to keep trees growing. Costa Rica has a whole ecosystem service payment system. In the United States, uh, I was at a big meeting, there were a lot of land trust people there. In California, big holdings of land trust are being paid millions of dollars by the hydroelectricity industry because it keeps soil from eroding in and silting in their reservoirs. It's big money. It would cost them much more if it silted in. So finding, getting people to understand the service that's being provided, whether it's to another private party, or whether it's the society as a whole, I think is a challenge. But I don't see why we couldn't just, just change um, Article 61 to say, you know, 
you get paid if you manage it for this purpose and that, you know, for, for recreation, for public recreation, for, for, um, uh, for, for carbon storage, for uh, biodiversity, wildlife habitat. We could do that. Hmm. It's, it's not really used, though, very much. It's, it's almost all for cutting it down. That's what you get the benefit for. But I do agree with you. There's a range of what can be done with forests as they're utilized. So just one or two more questions. Let's see. Oh, here. Uh, yes. been explained to them, they have come to understand what a problem this is. And so, as this gentleman over here said, they are taking it out of the bill as it stands. They're taking... Yes. Uh, I would be, except for the fact I heard the people who are behind this saying, oh, we'll just put it back in after, after this thing is set up. And that doesn't make me very happy. Well, I think the, the way it's being, being operated and the people who are behind it, I think if they changed, for example, the number, uh, the, the, the makeup of the, of the uh, whatever you call it, the, the, the steering committee, the whatever it's, it's operating it, and got rid of the special forest, we want to cut trees interests on it, I would feel a whole lot better about it. But I don't feel like they've taken any uh, any measures in opposing the, the biomass regulations that were just uh, issued. I wonder if they see themselves as you know as in a uh, in conflict with landowners. Um, but I, I just yeah. Am yeah interested Chris, in whether that whether that might change. What do you think? Well, I, I think again. The movement is, is based on a voluntary commitment by landowners either for tax benefits or for uh, payment, direct payment, to protect their land and keep farms as farms or forests as forests. And so uh, personally, I think that's where our strength is and, and really focusing on working with those willing sellers. Um, you know, the pipeline issue uh, also included land that had been permanently protected, which is why the land trust movement really got involved. Um, I think a similar analogy is, uh, you know, APRs, the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program. Uh, we work with farmers to permanently protect their land as farms. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, tell them how they have to manage their farms. That's, that's another conversation. It's, a, it's another level of, of conservation. And so I think there's all levels of conservation for land trusts. Uh, our most important priority for Kestrel is, is to maintain farms as farms and forests as forests and keep the development in places like village centers and, and uh, allow for development, but keep it compact. So I, I think that's where our strength is. Okay, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I know there's some people here who have information. If some of you are interested, uh, they'll be willing to hand that out, I think. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you all very much. <laughs>